school, no? Okay. So as you all know, this webinar series is basically focuses on space enthusiasts like you. So today also we have brought you an interesting as well as very informative webinar titled Aurora Borealis. So let me first ask you this. Uh, have you ever heard of Aurora Borealis? Where can you see those? Is it visible to human eyes? Mm, yes. Let's get all these questions answered. So today we have Kalpanini Masha, an undergraduate of Faculty of Geomatics, Sabaragumi University of Sri Lanka, to help you all with all the issues you have regarding Aurora Borealis. So before moving to the session, I would like to inform you that if you come up with any question, you can drop it in the chat box and towards the end, we will definitely answer all your questions. And as well, if you experience any connection issue due to the prevailing situation in the country, we would like to apologize in advance and please be patient and stay tuned until the end. So Ms. Kalpanini Masha, it's over to you to, the continu uh, to continue the session. Uh, thank you, Nandi. Um, I hope you all guys can see the screen. Um, is it? It's okay, it's visible. Okay. Um, um, hello, everyone, and a very good afternoon. So today we will be talking about an interesting, or we can say a very colorful topic. So, and this is going to be all about the, uh, the auroras. Uh, first of all, um, but before that, I must say here there may be uh, some of you may have heard of what is this auroras and some of you may have never seen or at least never heard of these, uh, these guys. So I'm going to show you a short clip and actually this is a time lapse of aurora and this will show you how it changes over a period of time in the sky. Mm. Hope you guys can see the movement and the light show you are seeing right now is called an aurora. So now we can continue this presentation. Um, first of all, I'm going to talk about what are these auroras. So it's uh, like it's a colorful thing. So, and simply we can say it is, a, it is an optical phenomenon, a natural light spectacle in the sky. And this is observed in high latitude regions, especially above 60 degree latitudes uh, from north and as well as from south. Uh, I hope you all know about these latitudes, but I can, just to give you a definition for this for the for this latitude and it is an imaginary line on earth that that is parallel to the equator so they are like kind of imaginary horizontal lines uh, you can see them on a map i hope you all know this know about these latitudes uh, the next important fact is uh, these regions have a have a weak magnetic field um, you will understand this, uh, this in the next few slides. Um, and the next thing is in Aur auroras, you will see different colors, red, green, yellow, uh, sometimes blue. And we will discuss why these colors and how are they formed. And uh, the next thing is, uh, these colors, I mean, they are not seen at the same level. 
they are observed at different altitude levels. Why these things happen? The reason behind all these things, you have to wait and we will discuss all this in, in the next slides. Mm. Then uh, these lights, Aurora's got several other names. I hope you guys can see the image. The first thing is, um, if, you, if you are near the North Pole, the auroras you see, you will call them Aurora Borealis or the Northern Lights. And if you are near the South Pole, you will call them as Aurora Australis or the Southern Lights. First of all, we will talk about these Northern Lights. Uh, as we said earlier, these northern lights are observed in the northern latitudes. We, uh, we, uh, we talk, I told that they are observed above the 60 degree latitude. And uh, so this name, the name Aurora Borealis was given after the name Boreas. It is the Greek name used to refer for the north wind. And as mentioned in the slide, uh, Canada and Scan Scandinavian countries are the best places to watch the northern lights. Then I'm going to talk about, so if you are thinking or if you wish to see these northern lights, so we will see where and when to see the northern lights. Uh, these lights can be observed 24 hours a day, seven days a week and 365 days a year. That means throughout the entire year. But, but that doesn't mean it is easy to observe. You need to be at the right place and, and at the right time. And that is important. The best place to see these Northern Lights is, is any destination in the auroral zone. So this zone is the area within an approximately 1,550 miles, uh, nearly like 2,500 kilometers radius of the North Pole. Uh, if I name such places, they would be from Fairbanks in Alaska, Yellowknife in Canada, Svalbard in Norway, uh, Abisko National Park in Sweden, Rovanium, Rovan, sorry, Rovanium in Finland, and pretty much anywhere in Iceland. The best time to see the, I mean, the best time of the year to see these lights is between September to April. And these times the sky gets dark enough to see the aurora. And the most action usually happens between 9 p.m. to 3 a.m. Here you can see some images of southern lights uh, and they are really, really beautiful, colorful and very fascinating. And these, so simply we can say these southern lights are the, are the southern counterpart of the Aurora Borealis. So you might wonder why, wonder why I used Aurora Borealis in, when I talk about these southern lights, that is because this um, the southern pole is less populated than the northern pole. So, so the so due to this fact, the lights are commonly, I mean, for this for the both types of auroras, we commonly use the word aurora borealis. Um, and anyway, the best places to observe these lights are from South America and Australia. Uh, now we will see where and when to see this, see the southern lights. Uh, they too can be can be viewed all year round, but especially in winter. That is from May to August and it is also visible in the spring in September. 
uh, the other thing is when uh, so if we are as far south as possible like in tasmania we can see them more clearly uh, here i'm going to show you a world map i mean here you can see clearly the places where the these aurora borealis commonly occur so here you can see it's available from 60 degree latitude 60 degree north latitude and upwards and in the south case 60 degree south latitude and downwards so here it's the aurora borealis and here in the near the south pole it's the aurora australis Uh, and now I'm going to talk, I'm going to discuss about some historical events related to these auroras. The first thing is the first, I mean, the first observation, or we can say the record of these northern lights come from, uh, come from a 30,000 year old cave uh, in France. It was a painting. And in 1619, Galileo Galilei thought he um, he thought that these lights are due to sunlight reflection from the atmosphere, and he is the one who named it as Aurora Borealis. And in 1790, Henry Cavendish he made quantifiable observation and using the technique triangulation to and estimated that the aurora Aurora light is produced around 100 to 130 kilometers in altitude. And in 1902 to, to 1903, Christian Birkland, he concluded from his Terella experiment that this light was caused by the currents flowing through the gas of the upper atmosphere. And these things I and mean, these observations or we can say these experiments were in the past and we have now the definitions have somewhat changed so we will discuss this and next i'm going to talk about the recent the recent activities regarding these these lights so the most important thing is nasa launched nasa launched five satellites so they were called as themes, sorry, themes, and they were used. The mission of these satellites uh, were to find what causes the shimmering. That means um, why suddenly they brighten and dance in a spectacular way, like that. And in 2007, so they could, uh, these five identical satellites line up line up every four days along the equator and took observations with the ground observations. Uh, and here, um, it is also about these satellites and how they worked here. Uh, and I would like to jump into the next slide. Um, anyway, uh, we have come to the most important part of the of the discussion that is what causes the aurora in the first place that means the physics behind this incidence and for that uh, for that i'm going to show you a video and i hope you guys will try to try to listen to this and so it's going to be a, it's going to be a simple simple explanation and we will see the sun was born billions of years ago as a ball of gas. It consists of billions and billions of particles of hydrogen, helium, and a bunch of other elements. Its outermost part, however, is one of the hottest parts of the surface. It is called the corona. Because of the high heat in the corona, the gas molecules inside lose some particles. These particles either have a positive charge or a negative charge and hence are called charged particles. Fascinating, isn't it? 
these charged particles have so much energy that they move away from the sun at a very high speed. Now, just like moving air particles on Earth form winds, these moving charged particles of the sun are called solar winds. These solar winds have a very high speed. And if they were to hit Earth at that speed, it would cause mayhem. Just imagine a ball being thrown at you at a high speed. If it were to hit you directly in the face, it would hurt a lot, wouldn't it? But what would you do to protect yourself? You would use your hands as a shield. Well, similarly, to shield itself from these solar winds, Earth uses its magnetic field, a protective layer around the planet. When the solar winds hit this magnetic field, they are not able to enter Earth's atmosphere. However, sometimes a huge stream of charged particles is released from the sun. This is called a coronal mass ejection. The interesting part is that these ejections are also magnetized and thus they interact with Earth's magnetic field. Due to this interaction, Earth's magnetic field stretches like a rubber band and these particles are deflected. Once the magnetic field comes back together, some particles from the coronal mass ejection come back with it and travel along the field lines all the way to the Earth's poles. After these charged particles reach the poles, they enter Earth's atmosphere and interact with the gas particles present there. The particles in Earth's atmosphere, however, do not have a charge on them. So, when they interact with the charged particles, they get charged as well. And boom! This releases energy in the form of the colorful lights that we saw in the sky. The sun. Um, I hope you guys understood the physics behind this incident, or oh, at least you may have got, you may have get a, have a certain idea about this. But anyway, I would like to summarize the process once again. Um, and this is the case. The first, uh, the first thing is that the, the charged particles, the electrons and protons that flow out from the openings in the sun's atmosphere, so they, are move, they move at extremely fast velocities. And they come, so these particles, these charged particles are carried by so what we call this solar wind, they bring these charged particles towards the earth. And, and we all know that earth has its own, its own magnetic field and it acts like a bar magnet. And, but however, the magnetic field in sorry and the but however i must tell that the magnetic field at the at the poles they are really really not that much but it's weak so uh, and this allows the charged particles to breach into the earth's earth's atmosphere and when these charged particles come to the atmosphere and they interact with the, with the gases in our atmosphere and that results, the energy released in the interactions, they causes the, these, these lights. So you can see here an aurora ring, green color. And this is simply, we can say, this is what happens in the space. And then here comes another very important, I mean, a very important question. Then why these different colors? I mean, as I told you earlier, I, I mean, I told you that there are 
red the we can see red green blue and sometimes purple colors so then why these colors are different so that is what i'm going to talk in here and we'll and the reason is uh, this is the way i mean this variation in colors is observed based on the type of the gaseous particles i mean the charged particles are interacting with so for example um, here you can see this diagram here this one uh, if this charged particles interact with oxygen that releases green and red colors but i mean if they are interacting with one gas then how come two colors that's the question and that means it is it depends on the altitude altitude means the height from the earth surface to the i mean if we say here here it is like the height from the earth surface to the sky to that at to that point and here you can see uh, i have given i have given you here the green the charged particles interact with oxygen uh, in between like 0 to 150 miles altitude and that gives green color and the same oxygen with uh, above 150 miles altitude they gives red color and that is why Uh, the red colored aurora is formed at higher altitudes and with reducing altitude it causes more common green colored aurora and and likewise blue color is given by the nitrogen and purple and violet is given or given also by nitrogen but in different altitudes so so i think you can understand that the reasons are the type of gas and the altitude and then here you can see a image the first three images show show uh, show you how the ice see this incident and the last three images images show you how the camera sees the incidents so but you actually you can see a difference so now i'm going to tell why that difference difference is there that is uh, so when we talk about that difference it's really necessary to understand understand that how the how our human eye work because um, you all know that we got our eyes got cones and rods that means the cells in our eyes they are the ones uh, responsible for i mean to detect the colors in bright light and faint colors in the dark and but since we observe these auroral light lights only at night our eyes can't perceive the vibrant colors and they only detect some shades of red that's the case and but it when it comes to the cameras the dynamic range of the dsl are camera is much higher than our eye so thanks to these cameras the true colors of auroras can be revealed uh, next i'm going to talk about some of the images and this image you can see a lime green colored aurora uh, that is just above the earth surface and this this has been taken from the international space station um at this time the space station was orbiting about uh, 258 miles nearly 415 kilometers so uh, and above russia and ukraine and and this image this image was uh, taken by the photographer daniel bofelli and it shows here you can see these are the clouds okay these green lights are the aurora, sorry aurora aurora part and this is this was this has been taken in during the winter and as i mentioned earlier the during the winter the nights are long and the lights are clearly they can be seen clear they can be observed clearly 
And this image, this is also something uh, that has been taken from the International Space Station on September 17, 2011. So at this time, the space station was crossing the Southern Indian Ocean. So you can see these lights somewhat closer than the earlier, earlier images. Um, and and here comes to the here comes to another very important part, and that is about are there aurora auroras on other planets? So someone this is I mean if someone think about this this topic this is I mean this question can come into their mind. Can there be I mean can there be such lights? on other planets. But the thing is, I mean, if a planet has an, has an atmosphere and magnetic field, they may probably have auroras. I mean, so we can simply tell, that is, so we know that there are, uh, these planets have these things and these planets have these things. So simply we can say, so these, these lights are not just, I mean, they are not something that is available only on Earth. So that is something uh, spread it to the universe beyond Earth. So now we are going to talk about some such instances. And here we are going to talk about uh, the Saturns, Mars, Jupiters, um, what do you say, Uranus and Neptune's lights. So uh, first of all, I'm going to talk about the Mars. And so the, I mean, the speciality of the auroras found on Mars is, it is a proton aurora. I mean, sorry, I will explain this. Uh, and this only occurs on the day side of the planet. If we talk about, if we discuss how this happened, we can tell um, like, uh, a solar wind proton first approaches the mass. I mean, anyway, they are coming at high speeds and for, and then they they meet a cloud of hydrogen that is around that is around the planet. And then the proton steals an electron from the hydrogen atom and then thereby be, they, then that hydrogen atoms become a neutral atom. Then these atoms passes through the passes through a magnetic obstacle around the mass, and that is called bow shock. Uh, and finally, these hydrogen atoms they enter mass mass atmosphere and they interact with gas molecules, and that causes the causes emission of ultraviolet lights. And that is how these lights on mass occur. Uh, then I would like to talk about Jupiter. Um, you can see this image, like blue color light and a ring like thing. So this was taken, this was captured by the NASA Hubble Space Telescope. And so if we talk about these lights, the special, so we all know that, the Jupiter is having a, having the most powerful and the largest magnetic field in our solar system. So it is obvious that it must, it, I mean, like it may have these, these kind of lights. But uh, there are three, I mean, three reasons, three reasons that make this Jupiter's aurora different from the other lights. So the first, the first, reason is, sorry, the first fact is um, these lights, we can never observe them with, with the human eye. So they can be just observed from using only these instruments. And the second thing is, even if they occur at the poles, so in Earth, in Earth, we have these lights in the northern pole and the southern pole. Likewise, in Jupiter also, we have 
the lights occur in the poles but unlike the earth i mean the earth's lights have a like similar similar behavior in both poles but in jupiter in two poles they have a different different behavior and the third fact is these um, emitting varying levels of energy so they may be high sometimes they may be low and this thing doesn't depend on the intensity of the sun's activity so that's all i mean that there are those special special things that we can see when it comes to the jupiter's case and uh, when it comes to saturn so you can see i mean a very beautiful ring like thing here that this is the southern south pole of saturn and so as as mentioned here this got a i mean an entirely different color spec color spectrum because in earth we got we got a spectrum like green at the bottom and red at the top but here that this aurora aurora spectrum is red at the bottom and purple at the top and this means i mean saturn's strongest auroras occur in the ultraviolet and the infrared wavelengths so the reason behind this is sun's plasma is being filled with electrically charged particles interacting with hydrogen and that is something that has to deal with the saturn's saturn scales and then if we come to this uranus so here there is i mean well we will first talk about this image you can see a blue color globe here and i hope you can see a small white spot on the planet uh, this first first one was taken on 16th november and the second one was taken on 29th november and the spot has been changed the position has been changed so the reason behind this is the magnetic axis of the planet and the spin axis so these the two axis got a difference in like 60 degree difference and unlike the other planets in the solar system that is why this got a little bit odd i mean odd action in this case and um sorry give me So give me one minute please Uh, sorry for the disturbances and then when it comes to the neptune so this is not uh, that much uh, perfect image i hope you can you guys can see this i mean this is the what do you say anyhow other uh, in neptune also there is a there is kind of like a main main important thing to discuss about that is this um, for this uh, light on neptune the neptune's rings also affect the i mean the neptune's rings also affect in a different way i mean that sweep away much of the plasma particles ejected by the sun and that leads to 
far less plasma heating Neptune's magnetic field to create these kind of displays on the planet. And so we discuss like, and that is how these lights occur on some of the planets in our solar system. And so anyway, that was a short discussion, I think so, but, uh, and anyway, this is the end of our discussion. I hope you guys learned something. Maybe it's new or maybe it refreshed your knowledge and uh, and but before that, before ending, I would like to thank the SAIDS Organizing Committee for inviting me and thank you all for listening. Have a nice day. Am I audible to you? Yes, you can hear. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ms. Kalpani. We are very much grateful for you for bringing your expertise and knowledge to this session. And I believe that it was a very productive session for you as well. So, dear participants, your attendance marks the success of this webinar, and we would like to thank you all as well. So everyone, hopefully we will meet you all with another interesting session in the near future. Until then, stay safe and goodbye.